Hello and welcome to the Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture series. I'm Mike Dalton and today we're going to be looking at contemporary urban environments. And I'm going to be looking particularly at regeneration and its relationship with gentrification to think through some of these uh, issues around changing city spaces, contesting place, gentrification, governance and community as the title suggests. So to do that, we're going to be um, having a little think about what regeneration actually means. Um, importantly, I think looking at what governance means as, as, uh, as a process and, and where governance fits within regeneration, uh, regeneration schemes, urban development. We're going to be having a look at um, a case study of Nine Elms very briefly to hopefully illuminate what we mean by the governance of regeneration and, and some of the implications of the governance of um, regeneration schemes such as Nine Elms, which will lead hopefully seamlessly into the concept of gentrification and then think about where um, new forms of gentrification differ so markedly from the original ideas of gentrification formulated by Ruth Glass in the 1950s and 60s how these new forms of gentrification are so different uh, that they've been described as, for example, super gentrification and also increasingly now uh, state led gentrification, which hopefully will you know, again bring the idea of governance back into the equation. And importantly, we're going to look at where community fit, where um, communities fit, I should say, and um, where they fit within these increasingly contested spaces and contested ideas of how spaces, how locales, how communities should be regenerated, you know, if at all. Where does the power uh, lie there in these sorts of processes and, and, you know, how are communities able to or not able to shape um, the regeneration of the locales that they live in? So that's the plan. Before looking at regeneration and gentrification, it's worth noting that more than half of the population of the planet now live in urban environments. The United Nations have estimated that something like 70% of all people on this planet will be living in cities by 2050. We also know that cities are constantly changing, constantly in a, a state of flux and shaped by, continually shaped by flows and shifts of people, industries, commerce, by money moving around the planet, culture, technology, climate and climate change, politics and importantly power. So um, we know this, we know that most people now live in cities, so the majority of the people on the planet are going to be increasingly living within these contexts of these flows and these shifts. So if we turn now to regeneration as a concept, it, it's, um, it can be described as a key way in which parts of our cities are transformed. Essentially run down parts of the city or parts of the city that have been identified as run down. It's not necessarily the same thing. But nevertheless, um, these parts of the city is being transformed through regenerating the, the, the material fabric of these locales. Transforming post-industrial brownfield sites, for example, into brand new shiny spaces for things like retail, for leisure, and importantly, for homes. And I have to say, housing is going to um, be the main focus of this lecture today. Regeneration has been described by Roberts uh, in um, Talon 2013 as a comprehensive and integrated vision and action, which leads to the resolution of urban problems and one which seeks to bring about a lasting improvement, importantly, in the economic, the physical, the social and the environmental conditions of an area. So in other words, you know, all kind of aspects of life uh, for people living in the city. Just to give you um, a, a good example, I have to say in this lecture, um, it's largely going to be UK focused. Uh, that's what I know most about. And it looks like it's mostly going to be uh, rather London centric. Uh, but a lot of these processes are being repeated, being mirrored on a global scale. And, and certainly I'm sure all of you will recognize these processes in your own uh, 
locales, high streets, cities, etc. So this is King's Cross, as you can see, um, this is um, what the back of King's Cross looked like in uh, the turn of the century, actually, around about two th the year 2000. And that site has been transformed into uh, this kind of vibrant green space, welcoming for people to um, pursue leisure, to go shopping, um, to go to college. So an absolute transformation that fits the bill of the, um, the criteria outlined in the, in the previous slide about um, the various aspects of regeneration, good environment, um, economic regeneration, a good social space, a new cultural quarter, if you like. So pretty much fitting all the criteria. Importantly, um, I just want to go over uh, some ideas around the concept of governance, because clearly um, our cities are being shaped by you know, key sets of actors who make the key decisions on what to regenerate and you know, which spaces to regenerate and how to regenerate them. If we just start at the beginning of what governance means, from your A-levels, you, you're probably already aware that governance refers to the the process by which a country or region is run. In other words, the way that it's administered. Public administration, you know, we normally think of the government, it could be central government, it could be uh, the local authority, the local form of government that essentially govern the spaces that we live in. Um, it continues, it relates to how well run a place is. Good governance implies that national and local government are effective in keeping people safe, healthy and educated. Well, that's quite a claim. Um, when, we, when we look at governance through this lecture, I mean, hopefully you'll start to unpick this definition of what um, governance is and maybe uh, give it a more kind of critical lens, if you like. We need to think about who govern our cities. Clearly, central government, local government have a role, but there are other important actors that do the act of governing, essentially, that make decisions on shaping our cities. So we need to have a little think about who actually governs our cities. Quite often there'll be you know, a range of partners that will be involved in regeneration programs that can be seen as essentially governing those spaces. And we'll have a little look at some examples as we go along. You know, importantly, who has the right to regenerate our cities, to regenerate our urban spaces? The people that have the right to make these decisions are essentially, you know, um, acting as a form of governance. Is it the community? Um, is it property developers? Is it the local government, the local authority? Um, we'll, we'll have a look as we go along. And what are the key factors determining, determining where and how to regenerate urban spaces. So governance as an idea has been, um, has been coming under an increasingly uh, critical lens lately, uh, with people like Hall and Barrett arguing that, um, you know, in, the, in, in the case of this quote, they're saying, well, we're now living through a phase of what they describe as chaotic capitalism and more emasculated planning systems driven primarily by economic rather than social imperatives. In other words, uh, the planning of our cities, the planning of regeneration, which we'd normally associate with um, the government, the local government perhaps, being in control of, these forms of regeneration are increasingly now being driven by outside interests beyond government and also primarily by economic interests rather than, for example, social interests, social imperatives. And what we're seeing here is really a conflict of, of use value. Thinking about what we want to do um, with spaces that are ripe for regeneration, for example, what uses they may be is it just about thinking about regeneration based on the most amount of money that can be made from that um, regeneration? Or should we be actually thinking about other uses, other ways of thinking about what value means here in these, in these um, spaces of regeneration? For example, um, social cultural values. So for example, you know, it, would local communities like, I don't know, a 3G football pitch? Would they like a skate park? Would they like a green space for the community to share in? 
could even be um, based around community gardens, for example. All these different forms of land use have a particular value to the community that seem to become insignificant when compared to the potential financial value of those spaces. So there is a bit of a contestation of what value means in these um, contexts. Is it a case of urban development being dominated in increasingly by property owners and property developers seeking to extract the maximum surplus from land values rather than addressing social need? In other words, um, something that Neil Smith talked about, um, the exploitation of the rent gap uh, that you might be interested in following up if you're feeling brave. In other words, um, what Neil Smith and others have argued is that um, profit seekers have been looking at rundown areas with low land values and seeking to develop those areas and maximise the amount of profit that they can get from those areas, from those spaces, from those locales by, for example, building luxury housing and selling them, you know, at great cost and great profits. That's putting it simply, um, but that's the general idea around this issue of the rent gap in this context. These issues around governance and the relationship between um, you know, the state, the local state, for example, and other actors um, needs to be thought through. We can't always tell where the kind of power relationships lie within these um, networks, within these you know, coalitions of different actors involved in development um, projects. But we do know that regeneration is often carried out by private and um, public and private partnerships rather, such as local authorities and property developers. There's a good reason for this. Uh, it makes absolute sense for all the partners involved. Um, you know, local authorities, they have the powers to, to grant pl planning applications. What we also need to understand is, you know, local authorities have a series of obligations like addressing housing problems in their locales economic development in their locales. We do know that certainly since 2010, um, when David Cameron's coalition government came in, there's been uh, cuts to local authority budgets by at least 40%. So local authorities have been financially constrained uh, in what they can do in their ability to regenerate the spaces that they govern. So it makes absolute sense from that perspective for local authorities to work with other actors, investors, private investors, private property developers, because they've got the cash. And in doing so, um, there'll be a series of agreements that local authorities will be making with these property developers in order to extract at least some potential affordable housing, social housing out of these uh, housing developments. If it's uh, new retail spaces, you know, they may have um, manage to lever in money for you know other forms of infrastructural development in the locale so the main point here is that um, it makes sense for local authorities to work with private de uh, developers having said that it does raise some serious issues around um, the power relations within these new essentially governance relationships and if we take the case of nine elms here what we're looking at here, this is um, on the south bank of the River Thames, actually. You can probably just make out Battersea Power Station here that's being regenerated. This is um, an architect's uh, image of what Nine Elms will look like. Um, it's not been completed yet. Um, and it's pretty difficult to make out, but there's the American Embassy there um, at the top end of, of the development on the, the far kind of eastern side. And this is essentially a brownfield site that's been undergoing extensive um, regeneration since it was identified by uh, Ken Livingston's uh, Greater London Authority way back in um, the early 2000s as, a, as an opportunity area that needed um, regenerating and redeveloping. As you can see, this is just uh, an example of some of the increasingly global um, 
corporations, development companies, development groups that were involved in the regeneration of this space. And what they represent is a literally um, you know, a global level of speculative property investment that is impacting on the locale. We've got the Dalian Wonder Group, uh, that are um, a Chinese development group. We've got um, a Malayan um, investment company, the uh, Permodalan Nacional Berhad, I think, uh, which has been um, given uh, lots of support from the Malaysian government. We've got the Barclay Group, that are a UK based um, regeneration company, development company. Um, Ballymore that are Irish, I think. Uh, Damak that are from the United Arab Emirates. So you can see that um, money from across the planet is being invested into this site in South London. So given the scale, uh, given the level of um, global finance that's pouring into the Nine Elm site, you know, and clearly other sites across the planet, and there's some big questions of, you know, who has the power? Who actually governs here? Who has the power to make decisions on what to build and who to build for? Uh, the Nine Elms development, um, approximately something like 20,000 new homes are um, planned to be built on this site, as well as new retail spaces. I think um, Apple are going to have their European headquarters, for example in um, the Battersea Power Station once it's been um, redeveloped. So all sorts of um, new forms of economic development, hopefully social improvement at some point. There's going to be a new linear park running through it. It's going to be a new tourist destination. It's going to be a hugely important uh, centre for economic growth for the London boroughs of Lambeth and Wandsworth. Um, that have the um, administrative political jurisdiction of this site. Um, we need to look at some of the key actors involved. So clearly central government has been involved. Um, the Greater London Authority have been involved in some of the, the, the larger logistics, such as underpinning um, the finance for creating two new tube stations, for example, that are going to run through uh, this site. The London boroughs of Lambeth and Wandsworth, you know, this is their land. So they've been the kind of the lead in terms of the overall um, planning and the granting of um, planning permissions. Working with property developers, as we've just seen, such as Barclay Homes, the Dalian Wonder Group, etc. And also working with the people that originally owned uh, these various plots of land on uh, the Nine Elms site and Vauxhall site, actually, uh, such as Royal Mail and New Covent Garden who will also have their own vested interests in extracting as much profit from any sales they need to make, um, as you would expect. Clearly for the, um, the London boroughs of Lambeth and Wandsworth, this presents a perfect opportunity really to extract social benefits potentially from uh, the property developers who are seeking to extract as much profit as possible, as you'd understand from this site. So, um, for example, Lambeth Borough Council are trying to get something like 40% of all housing built uh, in this project on their land as affordable social housing. So trying to make some real social gains and affect um, impact on housing waiting lists in the London Borough of Lambeth as much as they possibly can by granting permissions to property developers. We know that they're under-resourced, that local authorities are under-resourced, so this could be presented as a logical way for them to extract value from this regeneration in the form of um, social housing, affordable housing. And for the, uh, the London Borough of Wandsworth, they're seeking to get something like 15% of all housing um, as affordable and social that's built on uh, one's um, land. Straight away we can see um, that there's a bit of a postcode lottery there between people on waiting lists in Lambeth and in Wandsworth. Clearly there's a difference between 15% and 40% in terms of affordable and social housing depending on which side of those borough lines that you live. 
We should also say at this point that um, affordable housing is relative. Um, since the, the coalition came in in 2010, I think the actual legislation went through in, I think it was 2011. But now affordable housing is designated as something like 80% of the market value of properties um, for sale and for rent. So given that some of the um, some of the cheapest properties, for example, in um, Batsy Power Station, are around about a million pounds, clearly 80% of a million pounds isn't going to translate into affordable housing for people on average incomes and low incomes that live in that area. So there's lots of issues to think about around the implications of these sorts of um, arrangements between local authorities and property developers. Which leads me on to uh, the issue of gentrification, of course. Um, we can't really think about regeneration without thinking about the possibilities of gentrification. Now, Ruth Glass, um, a sociologist, um, came up with this idea of gentrification, having looked at changes across London, particularly um, across um, West London, places like Notting Hill and Kensington, where she saw um, working class communities um, increasingly being replaced by wealthier, more professional classes who were um, buying up you know, relatively low value, dilapidated properties and doing them up. And by doing so, um, that these new professional classes, if you like, this new landed gentry, which the, the term gentrification refers to, they were pushing up property values. They were bringing in um, the kind of forms of consumption and culture that, that we associate with those middle classes effectively that were moving into the area and replacing working class um, communities, working class cultures, working class housing. That's pretty much what uh, we mean by gentrification. And as you can see here, this is, you know, the relatively run down working class communities of, of Notting Hill in the 1950s. As no doubt we all know now, this is what um, Notting Hill tends to look like now. Um, four befores almost in every drive and, um, you know, very expensive, renovated uh, housing dominated by, uh, you know, the affluent. There's lots of good things about um, gentrification, but there are also many negatives, as we've seen. Um, you know, clearly the gentrification of places like um, Notting Hill has meant that the urban fabric, um, urban fabric rather, has been renewed, repaired, as in, you know, gleaming condition. Um, we see, you know, economic renewal, as well as just the, the renewal of the urban fabric. So we need to think a little bit about who benefits, you know, who wins and who loses. I'm sure you've you've all walked up and down, you know, your local high streets or your local communities and seen examples of gentrification happening in your locales. Um, this is actually New York, I think, but it, it it's very similar to parts of South London where I live. And I have to say, I really enjoy going into, you know, craft beer bars or nice coffee shops, a nice delicatessen even. Um, luckily, I can afford to just about at the moment, um, but not everybody can. And so, you know, for some of us, um, you know, there are many positives from gentrification at a fairly superficial level. In my case, as a superficial person, things like bars and coffee shops are great. But if that's at the expense of um, the original communities that were living there, um, you know, poor, often, often ethnically diverse uh, groupings are being pushed out, then that's not such a good thing. Um, so we need to think about who benefits and who loses and in what ways. OK, and maybe that's something that you can discuss in your class um, after this lecture. So that's the form of uh, gentrification that we will associate ourselves with. That kind of um, almost natural process of people moving across the city. You know, it's understandable that people uh, will seek to you know, particularly if they're buying properties, seek to buy properties that they can afford, you know, maybe 
uh, repair and do up. That seems almost logical, doesn't it? And a kind of um, a gradual process of change across the city. And communities are always shifting across cities since the beginning of time. Cities, are, as we said at the beginning, are always evolving in this, this kind of state of flux. But we're seeing new forms of what have been called gentrification now that are fundamentally different to the form of gentrification being described and identified by Ruth Glass in the 1950s and the 1960s. What we're seeing is um, essentially kind of hyper wealth investing in these um, quite often run down uh, parts of the city. You know, the idea of this um, exploiting this rent gap is being taken to new levels with new incredibly expensive complexes um, being built specifically for it has to be said the kind of the richest most affluent um, parts of global societies so to give you an idea of these forms of um, super gentrification which Lees and Hubbard describes literally superimposing this extreme wealth into locales that have very little relationship with the local communities, you know, the history, the economic, the social and cultural history of those spaces, potentially. We see the, these two um, Akon uh, developments across the planet. Akon, um, a part of uh, a development by the, um, the Damak uh, group, who are from the United Arab Emirates and are, as you can see, um, working on a global scale. This is the uh, the Acon development in Nine Alps in London that we've just been looking at. The uh, internal uh, decor apparently has been designed uh, by Donatella Versace. It's being sold as um, you know housing for the privileged. That's literally the way it's being marketed. And 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 feel free to to Google. Um, Acon or use other search engines, of course, and, and have a look at some of the promotional material for Acon in Nine Elms and a very similar development uh, in uh, Dubai, uh, the kind of sister development to the development in Nine Elms, really illustrating that this kind of global flow of wealth and regeneration that's taking place uh, in, in cities across the planet. Hubbard makes the point that um, many policies of regeneration seem to be kind of taking back marginal spaces from marginal people. You know, this idea of um, taking pockets of land that are, that are lived in by some of the kind of poorest, most marginal, most politically weak, if you like, um, groupings in our cities and rather empowering those communities, rather empowering the marginal. Um, Hubbard argues that Regeneration is effectively transforming these what have been described as landscapes of poverty and decay into prestigious, more ordered space through, as he says, selective investment and redevelopment, specifically aimed at attracting these more affluent residents. You know, exemplified by that um, super gentrification that we were looked at, but now in the context of what's been termed state-led uh, gentrification that I'm going to talk about now, where essentially uh, the state is having an active role in regenerating spaces uh, that effectively displace the marginal, the poor, and replacing them with more affluent people. That's the argument um, the geographers such as, such as Hubbard's uh, are making. And it's worth thinking about, I think. So an example of state led gentrification, um, you know, one amongst many across the planet now, but one example is the Haygate Estate in the Elephant Castle in South London, very close to the Aylesbury Estate, which is another large council um, housing estate that's going through a very similar process, both in the, the London Borough of Southwark. And you may wish to follow up um, what's happening in these two estates after the lecture to give to give you a, a kind of clearer, deeper sense of what state-led gentrification means in practice. Um, so the Haygate estate, a large uh, council estate made up of people that uh, rent their flats from the London Borough of, Borough of Southwark, but also a number of um, people who've bought their flats from the council and are now essentially uh, leaseholders. <clears throat> 
Southwark decided that they couldn't afford to maintain the estate to keep it in good repair as a result of you know, continued cuts to local authority funding. They saw it as a good opportunity to kind of reinvent that space with some housing for existing um, tenants and leaseholders and some housing for um, people from outside of the area, essentially more affluent potential homeowners, investors coming into this space, hopefully producing you know, the economic benefits of increased rates, less burden of welfare payments, economic growth as a result of it becoming a more kind of affluent community. That's the kind of logic behind it. So um, the London Borough of Southwark uh, brought in a development partner lend lease group who are an australian property developer with developments across the planet now to give you an idea of the kind of size and power of lend lease in 2016 they had a turnover a revenue of something like 16 billion us dollars so a hugely powerful player in these forms of regeneration the idea of this mixed community um, was to completely regenerate revamp the area but clearly one of the consequences of that was to essentially gentrify the area. So promises made to um, the people living there that they could come back and live in the new regeneration became increasingly problematic uh, when certainly those earning um, the, the leaseholders, people owning their properties, were told that they were going to be paid compensation for their properties, which were being compulsory purchased up to the value of something like 40% of the value of the new properties that were replacing their homes. So there was absolutely no way that people living in those um, apartments could buy into the new Elephant Park. Essentially what we saw then was uh, the communities living in uh, the Haygate estate being dispersed. And I'll just show you uh, a map essentially being dispossessed and dispersed. So this is a map on um, a website from Southwark Notes, which were you know a community group that you might like to look at who um, who have various forms of um, kind of protest and, and, and resistance to what was going on there. And they drew up this map of where people um, that owned leases essentially people that owned their properties in the Haygate, where they ended up as a result of the demolition of the Haygate estate. And so you can see this widespread dispersal um, across Greater London and beyond. Unfortunately, I can't quite show you the bottom of the map because for some reason it won't uh, fit onto PowerPoint, but it goes deep into Kent, deep into Essex. So you get the sense of that kind of you know, dispersal of the people living in that community as a result of regeneration and effectively what we're terming, terming as state-led gentrification. Now, in most regeneration processes these days, there's an element of um, engagement with the local community. You know, one thing Southwark would say was that they commuted uh, communicated, consulted local communities, the communities of the Aylesbury estate, the Haygate estate. Um, there's lots of good things about, has to be said, about community consultation and it, it's become a norm really in all um, regeneration processes, particularly those that are managed by local authorities, it has to be said. There's lots of good things about, um, potentially about community consultation engaging with local communities. Some of the positives are that it can lead to, you know, local communities, local participants really feeling empowered, uh, feeling that they're valued and, and feeling that they have a say in the regeneration of, you know, the locales that they live in. It can also give um, support um, from the community to the regeneration projects if they feel that they are now you know key stakeholders in this regeneration and actually have a voice and importantly uh, you know local authorities and uh, developers can actually draw on local knowledge local expertise and feed those um, knowledges 
and expertise into the development plans. You know, tailor the development to meet the kind of wishes, desires and needs of local communities. You know, that's the theory. Think back to the Haygate estate, perhaps, and think how that worked in practice. But nevertheless, you know, there are lots of um, potentially positive um, stories out there that illustrate the power of participation and see if you can find some. Um, you know, the negatives are clearly that communities may be consulted, but ultimately ignored. Um, you know, in the case of the Haygate, the Aylesbury estate, the local residents actually didn't want their homes to be demolished. So you could argue that they were consulted, but ultimately ignored. Um, consultation with local communities may be seen as a way of essentially legitimating development plans, even though they may actually oppose them. At least the local authority and the, and the developers can say, well, we consulted with local communities and they had a say. And that's really important uh, to note, I think. We'll be looking at hopefully a positive outcome, uh, which I'll talk about later uh, when we um, think about Crescent Gardens. Just because communities don't always have their um, their voices heard it doesn't stop them from giving voice. So what we're seeing you know, across the planet is this idea of communities challenging proposals for regeneration, for essentially gentrification, you know, contesting the futures of these spaces that they live in, that form their, you know, um, their life worlds effectively. And so, uh, you know, if you go back to the Southwark Notes website, you'll see lots of uh, really interesting ways in which local communities uh, try to resist the regeneration, such as walking the rip off, as it was called, when they went on a guided tour uh, between the two estates, you know, looking at the local fabric and the way it related to local communities. We see all sorts of um, protests, resistance, if you like, engagement with um, potential regeneration, you know, across our towns, across our cities. You know, this one's an image of local communities protesting about changes that are going on in Brixton, the gentrification of parts of Brixton and the implications of that um, gentrification on local communities. So, um, you know, communities are not taking these forms of gentrification quietly. And also, this is a global protest where, um, you know, these contested spaces are being fought out across the planet. There's a really interesting uh, website that you could look at called Sense of Time that just shows you a collection of photographs of um, local communities rallying against proposed um, gentrification and often demolition. So this one on the left of the slide is um, from residents in San Francisco and, and Oakland that are protesting against um, proposed gentrification, proposed uh, regeneration and saying that actually, you know, the building of new homes should be for everyone. And here we've got um, a striking image of mattresses, a mural painted on mattresses in Seoul in South Korea. These mattresses are from demolished homes belonging to people um, displaced in the Yongsan uh, area of, of Seoul. So a really powerful emotive issue that kind of encapsulates some of the kind of more negative sides of um, gentrification in our cities at a global level. And I use the word hour because, you know, it's happening in cities across the planet. So that's a good place to stop, I think. Um, in conclusion, what we've looked at today, um, we thought about or understood how regeneration constantly reshapes urban spaces. We thought about, uh, looked at how global corporations and global finance are intimately connected now to local developments, locales being regenerated across the planet. We thought about how regeneration and gentrification are increasingly interlinked and we've looked at uh, different forms of gentrification such as super gentrification and state-led gentrification which increasingly um, problematize the uh, you know collective understandings of what regeneration is clearly it means 
a variety of processes now, some more extreme than others, it has to be said. We thought about how the lives of urban communities are you know, increasingly connected at the local level to these wider processes that we've, that we've been looking at, these processes of accumulation through global property speculation, effectively. And we also see that um, you know, clearly communities take part in these regeneration processes. They don't always have their voices heard, but we have seen that increasingly communities across the planet uh, are not taking these um, forms of gentrification line down. You know, they are getting their voices heard increasingly. Um, the final question really is, well, you know, from a governance perspective, from a, a kind of human rights perspective, who should have the right to shape our cities? We've looked at a, a group of different players, such as the state, the local state, property developers, global financial investors from across the planet, local communities where is the governance here who should have the right to our cities who should have the right to shape to regenerate our cities and i'll leave that one for you to discuss in class as well i think one way of doing that perhaps is through the class activity um, that goes with this lecture um, it's based on ongoing events at Cressingham Gardens, which is a council uh, estate in Tulse Hill in South London, where the local borough of Lambeth that own Cressingham Gardens have been seeking to demolish uh, this uh, estate, this community and replace it with, um, you know, more essentially kind of gentrified forms of housing, it has to be said again, seeking to make it what's known as a mixed community where you know the residents uh, the current residents uh, at least on paper are going to be invited allowed to um, to live in the new build the new regenerated space uh, where Cressingham Garden is if they can afford to do so Lo the local community has come up with all sorts of ingenious uh, ways of resisting the proposed de development they're not in favor of, de of uh, demolition and they've come up with some really practical and positive ways to try and uh, save their community, which hopefully you'll be looking at in this activity and kind of making sense of um, potential outcomes um, yet to be decided, it has to, has to be said, certainly at the time of the lecture. So do have a look uh, to see where uh, this whole um, conflict really between um, Lambeth and the local community to see where it is now and think through what you might like to see as a, a kind of fair outcome for everybody. Okay, uh, and last but not least, uh, there's a list of references that uh, I've been using for this lecture that you may want to um, have a look at yourselves, not least um, a nice course read of the Introduction to Human Geography by uh, Daniel Zatel. Okay, that's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. I'm going to be taking questions, I think, on this time next week, uh, next Monday. And so hope to see some of you there and hopefully answer any questions that you may have. OK, uh, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Uh, bye bye.